A very good morning and welcome to the keynote address, Nothingness and Creativity. Indeed, it's my privilege and honor to introduce Professor Dr. Yutaka Tanaka. Yutaka Tanaka, a professor of philosophy, a champion of Christian Buddhist white head dialogue and a thorough gentleman. As professor of philosophy, he has been serving the Department of Philosophy at Sofia University, Tokyo, Japan. He was also the chair of the Graduate School of Philosophy for four years. In that capacity, he organized the eighth International White Head Conference at the Sofia University, Tokyo. He has, to his credit, several publications, books and articles, the most important book from paradox to reality. As a champion of the dialogue between Christians, Buddhists and Waitadians, he serves as the president of Japan Society of Process Studies, president of Japan Society of Buddhist Christian Studies, and director of Nishida Philosophy Association. Let me conclude with a personal note. I was fortunate to be at the Sofa University during my sabbatical days, and Professor Itaga Tanaka was my colleague, friend, and mentor. I could experience his hospitality and warmth, and his key attention to the details of my stay, my programs, and my activities at the Sofia University. So with your kind permission, may I now invite Professor Yutaka Tanaka for the keynote address, Nothingness and Creativity Towards an Integral Philosophy of Creative Transformation. Over to Professor Yutaka Tanaka. Thank you so much for the introduction. So my presentation nothingness and creativity uh, towards an integral philosophy of creative transformation. It is a long paper, uh, about uh, uh, 40 pages. So I would like to read only a part, of, especially the part one, uh, chapter four, and part two and chapter three, and the, uh, part three. Main focus is on part three. The key concept of uh, this paper is analogia nullius entis, or analogy of nothingness, and the topology of nothingness. So uh, I would like to explain these two concepts first, please. Uh, Part one and chapter four. So I select uh, some points, uh, relevant points. It is a common knowledge that Karl Barth reject the possibility of natural theology through replacing analogia entis by analogia fide. The analogy of faith is important to Karl Barth, but he says analogy of being is not the Christianity. Whereas Tobists maintain the consistency and continuity between grace and nature in the celebrated principle that grace does not destroy nature but perfects it. Barth emphasizes the inconsistency and discontinuity between grace and nature. Analogy falls between God's revelation and the human's decision and response and between God's knowing me and my knowing God. In Bart's analogy of faith, being follows operations rather than the vice versa. The identification of God with being, with capital B itself, that is, the concept of God as the first cause of creatures' beings, would be misplaced when, if we can neither know God's being through analogia entis of this world, 
no abstract, the mere being of God from his self-revelation as a triune God in history. Thus, Bart's denial of analogia and this is closely related to his intolerance of religion and unbelief. But what about analogia nidius entis, analogy of nothingness? This is my uh, task. Whereas Christian theology does not seem to have ever used such an analogy, it is obvious that the Buddhistic realization of nothingness, or shunyata, cannot positively be without analogia nullius entis because of the primacy of nothingness over being and of the negative over the positive way. Shinichi Samatsu's Tractatus, titled The Characteristic of Oriental Nothingness, deals with the Zen Buddhist self-understanding of shunyata, or emptiness. To avoid possible conceptual confusion, when we apply Western categories to shunyata, he discusses the problem of what oriental nothing is not as a via negativa and has classified five types of our uh, misunderstanding oriental nothingness. This misunderstanding is five. First, nothingness as a negation of existence. Nothingness as a negation of predication. Nothingness as abstract idea nothingness as imagined, and nothingness as unconscious. These four under, uh, five understanding is all misunderstanding in Sabbath Shinichi. Though Shunata is a transcendental concept, and more precisely, that which transcends conceptualization, we may use linguistic conventions as a figure or analogy of nothingness if we truly awaken to the absolute denial of nothingness. Fritz Wurri, a Protestant theologian which studies the Kyoto schools, compares Sabbath's analogy of oriental nothingness with the analogy of being in the Western tradition of natural theology. Although he does not systematically discuss the implication of analogia duris entis to Christian theology, his comparative analysis suggests a new perspective in which we can see the universal truth which transcends the discrimination between East and West of Buddhism and Christianity. The adjective oriental would be superfluous if we realize absolute nothingness just in the same way that we find in the Buddha nature no such discrimination between South and North as in human beings. As Hans Waldenfels and Van Vracht rightly points out, the Kyoto school philosophers of religion, including Hisamatsu and Takizawa, tend to disregard the Catholic tradition of Christianity. They prefer subjective faith of Protestantism to the objectivity of Catholic truth. If they are interested in the medieval Christianity, their discussions seem to be about Christian mystics exclusively. The historical relation between Christian mystics and Catholic theology is generally skipped over by them. Keiji Nishitani's God and Absolute Nothingness, for example, compares the works of the German mystic Master Eckhart with Zen Buddhism on the basis of German vernacular sermons, but does not seem to recognize the background of medieval Catholic theology found in Eckhart's Latin works. If we mean by Catholicism 
the universal truth of Christian faith, Veritas Catholica, which transcends the antithesis between subjective faith and objective truth. That is a truth as a middle way between the negative theology of mysticism and the positive theology of dogmatism, then we must reconsider the relation between Nishida's philosophy and Catholic Christianity. There is no such thing as Roman or Anglican Catholicism in the strict sense of the word. We cannot identify Catholicism with a particular denomination of Christianity historically and culturally restricted within a particular climate of thoughts. The Catholic truth of Christian faith is the idea of which Christians must seek and realize through the negation of what is called religious ideologies. It necessitates a radical criticism of ideology just in the same way the middle way of Buddhism does in the examination of biased views. The purpose of Nietzsche's philosophy is to grasp the true individual in the universal which he calls the topos or the place of absolute nothingness that transcends every kind of categorical predication. Through this transcendence of nothingness of categories, we are far from being confined within subjective mysticism totally open to the universal truth. We can communicate with each other beyond the restriction of biased views only through the realization of the universal topos of nothingness. Nietzsche's quest for nothingness can be compared with that of being in the Western tradition of ontotheology from Parmenides to Hegel. As Aristotle elucidated in his Metaphysics, being can be said in many ways, but it is not ambiguous in the sense of accidental hom homonym. Being has a unity of analogy with the distinction between central and derivative meanings. Existentia and essentia constitute two foci of being which presuppose the Aristotelian concept of substance. Being as existence is properly said of the primary substance, which is neither predicated of nor immanent in any subject. And being as essence is properly said of the secondary substance, which can be predicated of some subjects, but never immanent in any subject. In contrast with Aristotle, Nietzsche's concept of nothingness as a topos is characterized as that which is always predicated, never a subject. There is no such thing as nothing that is a predicable subject. Nothingness is nothing other than the topos, the place where beings are realized. Faithful to the tradition of Mahayana Buddhism, he rejects the concept of substance, subabhava. Individuals are not ready-made entities that exist and that then enjoy their own experiences. Rather, they are interdependent and immanent in each other as foresight of the creative world because an individual's experience of others constitutes its own existence. Thus, Nietzsche's concept of nothingness as topos suggests a new way of the Buddhist-Christian dialogue through analogia dubious entis as a synthesis of positive and negative ways. As this analogy concerns nothingness, it can face absolute transcendence in both Christianity and Buddhism, avoiding the fallacy of via positiva as the analogy of being. At the same time, we can discuss the absolutely immanent element, both in Christian existence and Buddhist awakening, because they are analogical in the topos of nothingness. Then I read the part two, chapter three,
and process theology and the logic of topos. I think Whitehead do, 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 does not use the logic of topos, but I think the his theory contains essentially is the logical place. So Whitehead replaces the Aristotelian phrase of being present in a subject in Greek, enshpokemenoi ena, and Whitehead translates it being present in a subject. Hypokemenon is a subject. So he replaces being present in the subject by objectification. In this context, the object is always a universal element inherent in a subject and objective reality, he says, realitas objectiva, does not mean the reality of a thing which exists independently of any subject as it usually means in modern philosophy. Rather, it signifies the reality of other entities objectified for an immanent in an actual entity. According to the principle of relativity, everything can function as an object. That is, every being has the potentiality for being an element in a real concrescence of many entities into one actuality. This is the principle of universal principle of relativity. What makes an entity actual is its subjectivity in the process of concrescence. And the actuality without subjectivity should be rejected as vacuous in Whitehead system. The subjectivity of an actual entity is always self-transcending. It gives itself as one object among others to the universe through the transition from the subjective immediacy to the objective immortality. In order to signify this character of self-transcendence, Whitehead replaces the concept of mere subject by that of subject superject. The actual entity is to be conceived both as a subject presiding over his, its own immediacy of becoming and as, as a superject exercising its function of objective immortality in other actual entities. The actual entity as a superject is a universal in the sense of its entering into the constitutions of other actual entities because it has become a being and it belongs to the nature of a being that it is a potential for every becoming. The actual entity in its own subjective immediacy is an individual occasion of experience in the sense that the same process of concrescence cannot happen twice on account of the insistent particularity of things experienced and the act of experiencing. The unity of opposite, such as the concept of an actual entity as a subject superject and as an individual universal, is a necessary condition for understanding the solidarity of the universe. So because the time is limited, I will skip the rest part and read the part three. So main focus is the part three of this presentations. Okay. <clears throat> In this section, I shall discuss Taravet treatise uh, titles from the schematism of time to the schematism of the world, which in 1932 he wrote after he had returned from Germany. Tadabe is the founder of the, of the Japanese uh, process societies, in my opinion. The really the, the dis disciples of Tarabe translated Whitehead's Science and the Modern World and the Process and Reality and Adventures of Ideas. So Tarabe is uh, uh, the philosopher 
which first, in, in, who first introduced Whitehead in the Philosophical Society of Japan. So, Tanabe's treatise may be considered as a synthesis of Nishida's metaphysical topology and the temporalistic analysis of human existence propounded by the young Heidegger, whom Tanabe encountered at Freiburg in the early 1920s. Nishida had shown that an individual's subjectivity is a not a substance, but an event which occupies place in the universal topos of absolute nothingness. Oh, please. Next. Okay. Next. Heidegger <coughs> has reformulated the Kantian schematism of time and transcendental imagination in such a way that the humans, be, human being's subjectivity is not due to the atemporal pure ego, but an event of self-affection which takes time because transcendence is primordially temporal. Then, Tanabe's task may be characterized as showing that transcendental subjectivity should be redefined as intersubjectivity in the sense that the self of an individual is essentially both existential and social, and that its subjectivity takes time and place in essentially dialectical unity in the historical world. Another aspect of Tanabe's treatise is that his philosophy is, as the theme of Kant's first critic was, both of science and of religion. He combined existential analytic of Heidegger with the contemporary revolution of science, especially the new discoveries of relativity physics, which breaks through the limit of Newtonian principles presupposed by Kant. Tanabe's philosophy is noteworthy in that it aims at synthesizing two mutually conflicting trends of modern philosophy, that is, existential philosophy on the one hand and scientific philosophy on the other. In this respect, Tanabe is very similar to Whitehead. In agreement with the philosophical spirit of science in the modern world, Tanabe himself cites Whitehead in the important context of his treatise on Heidegger in From the Schematism of Time to Schematism of the World. Tanabe discusses and criticizes Heidegger's revisionary rendering and the reformulation of Kant's theory of transcendental imagination and the problem of metaphysics. Appreciating quite a theory of relativity and his philosophy of nature, Tanabe replaces the Kantian theory of schematism of time by the schematism of space-time as extensive continuum in relativity physics, thus criticizing Heidegger's concentration on transcendental imagination and primordial time, which, according to Tanabe, essentially suffers from the remnant of subjective idealism. In critical pure reason, Kant proceeded from the thesis that there are two sources of human knowledge which probably spring from a common but to us unknown root, namely sense and understanding. He proposed to begin his transcendental inquiry only from the point at which the common root of our faculty of knowledge divides and throws out these two stems. But what is the origin of these two components of human knowledge, that is, sense and understanding, Sinnlichkeit and Verstand? If sense and understanding have a common root, we can comprehend them only when we discover 
further from the spring, identifying this common root with a transcendental imagination implanted in primordial time, Heidegger concludes that time is not only the form of the object of experience, but also that of the experiencing self, and that temporality is not the mere characteristic of empirical object, but essentially the ground of the free transcendence of the subject. The pure finite self has in itself a temporal character, and the fundamental determination which Kant provides for transcendental uphill substitution must, according to Heidegger, first become intelligible through this temporal character. Time and cogito, the I think, are no longer opposed to one another as unlike and incompatible. They are the same. In the Kantian perspective, the ego is not in me, in time. The ego is not in time. Though this does not mean that it is atemporal, rather, the ego is so temporal that it is time itself, and only as such in its very essence is it possible at all. Tanabe agrees with Heidegger that ego is not in time, just because it is time itself or projects time. But objects, Tanabe objects that Heidegger does not understand Kant's argument against subjective idealisms added in the second edition of Critique of Purism. Temporality without spatiality is an abstraction, and the laying of the foundation of the phenomenal world exclusively on the basis of primordial time tends to be idealistic in the subject with sense. There would be no such thing as external world. The ego is not only temporal, but also spatial in its dialectical unity, and Kant stressed in his refutation of idealism the fact that temporal determination of myself is possible only through my knowledge of spatial or external objects in the environment. In the other words, the relation between time and space is more fundamental than the between time and myself as the spatial objects. Temporality and spatiality constitute extensive continuum as inseparable wholeness, though they are irreducible to each other. Time as pure self-affection is inseparable from external things in space. The relation between time and space must be directly reciprocal in such a way that both constitute space-time as the extensive continuum in which subjectivity of an individual self should be re-grasped as intersubjectivity of the social self. The contemporary world, essentially spatially related to, but causally independent of the self, is irreducible to the actual worlds temporally related to the self. The external but communal character of contemporary actual entities is constituted by the schematism of the extensive continuum, or what Tanabe calls the schematism of the world. Please, that's right. Oh. More quick. <laughs> I would like to cite Whitehead. Okay. Uh, this one? Previous, uh, okay. Um, a previous slide. Mm. Oh, uh, next slide. Oh, sorry. Next slide. Sorry. Concerning the relation between the causally independent but communal contemporaries, communal contemporaries and the creative advance of the actual world, Tanabe cites Whitehead. When the events belong to the contemporary domain, they constitute the other worlds causally independent of me. In Whitehead's philosophy of organism, 
actuality is considered as process, as inner development of events which are monads of becoming as a synthetic unity between space and time. These events are independ independent as monads in the contemporary domain, and at the same time, new individuals temporarily constituted by the creative advance of totality. Next slide. Kant was a philosopher who first fully and explicitly introduced into philosophy the conception of an act of experience as a constructive functioning, transforming subjectivity into objectivity. The purpose of the schematism of the world was to make this functioning reciprocal and more dynamic. For the subjective idealist, the process whereby there is experience is a transition from subjectivity to apparent objectivity only. Tanabe complements this analysis with the inverse affection of the world on the individual and also explains the process as proceeding from objectivity to subjectivity as well, thus making the relation between an individual and the world completely dialectical. Next slide. Whitehead himself stresses both the epoch-making character of the temporary ego and the importance of its environmental world in this way. Descartes' cogito ergo sum is wrongly translated, I think, therefore I am. It is never bare thought or bare existence that we are aware of. I find myself as essentially a unity of emotions, enjoyments, hopes, fears, regrets, variations of alternatives, decisions all of them subjective reactions to the environment as affective in my nature. My unity, which is the cause cogito, I am, is my process of shaping this vector of material into consistent pattern of feelings. The individual enjoyment is what I am in my role of a natural activity as I shape the activity of the environment into a new creation, which is myself at this moment, and yet as being myself, it is a continuation of the antecedent world. Next. Whitehead characterized the philosophy of organism as an inversion of Kant's philosophy. Whitehead seeks to describe how objective data pass into subjective satisfaction and how order in the objective data provides intensity in the subjective satisfaction. For Kant, the world emerges from the subject. For the philosophy of organism, this subject emerges from the world, a superject rather than the mere subject. The word object thus means an entity which is a potentiality for being a component of feeling. The word subject means the entity constituted the process of feeling and includes this feeling. This inversion of Kant would be meaningless unless the concept of transcendental subjectivity in the Kantian schematism of time is replaced by the Whiteheadian concept of subject subjectivity in the schematism of the world, that is, extensive continuum. The next slide. The extensive continuum is a necessarily prerequisite of Whitehead's concept of society as a spatial temporal nexus of actual occasion. A set of entities is a society in virtue of a defining characteristics shared by its members and in virtue of the presence of the defining characteristic being due to the environment provided by the society itself. The point here is that the society mediates temporal subjectivity with spatial objectivity in such a way the nexus of actual occasions constitutes public matters of fact. 
In the same way, the schematism of the world is closely related with the logic of species which Tanabe first launched in the celebrated paper The Logic of Species and the Schematism of the World. Next. What, time means, what Tanabe means by the logic of species is the logic of social being, which dialectically mediates individual existence and the universal topos. The temporalistic analysis of the subjectivity of an individual existence should be combined with the topological synthesis of the subject subjectivity of the same individual essentially as a social being. So the next chapter, Tanabe's philosophy of science after metanoetics. Metanoetics is the third key word in these papers. It combines metanoia and metanoesis. It's a very Christian idea of uh, philosophy or the philosophy before philosophy or philosophy which negates philosophy. Yoshiharu Hakari, one of the representative scholars of non-church Christianity in Japan, has propounded the thesis that grace cannot complete nature without abolishing it, thus overcoming both the Thomistic principle that gratia non tolit naturam sed perficit and the Kantian principle of the religion within the limit of mere reason. This thesis may be considered as a retrieval of the right motif of Tanabe's philosophy as meta noetics. The completion of nature through its annihilation is considered by Tanabe as a paradox of grace. According to him, this paradox is a fact in the transcendence of natural reason, that is metanoesis, as a self-power which through the absolute repentance, metanoia of guilt, has experienced death resurrection by the grace of the other power, that is nothingness qua love, or in Christian terms, God as love, God as agape. The range of metanoetics is wide enough to include both Christianity and pure and Buddhism. Metanoetics can be viewed not only as a modern version of Shinran's Japanese uh, representative Buddhist Jodo Shinshu, it's Shinran's Kyogyo Shinsho, but also as a dialectics of Christian philosophy, because it is a philosophy which is not a philosophy, having abolished the self-power of natural reason. Metanoetics is neither dogmatic theology nor Buddhology based on any established religious authority. Next slide. Keiji Nishitari, another representative philosopher of the Kyoto School, points out that the unique characteristic metanoetics consist in the absolutely critical use of reason resurrected from death by grace, which does not come from the merely religious attitudes of a penitent person. Metanoetics has its own dialectics in order to dig to a deeper foundation which resurrects both religion and philosophy. Nishitari recommends us to read Tanabe's books on the philosophy of science written after metanoetics if we are to understand the full scope of the dialectic of Tanabe's philosophy as metanoetics. Next slide. Tanabe has written many treatises on the philosophy of science after his retreat to Karuizawa, an essay on the philosophy of dynamics. The development of mathematical philosophy from the perspective of historicism, a new methodology of theoretical physics, the dialectics of relativity physics, etc. Also, the title of these works do not seem to have any relevance to the philosophy of religion. Tanabe himself considers them as summing up his lifelong philosophical thoughts.
In order to understand of these works, we must know what Tanabe means by the philosophy of science. Just as the philosophy of religion should be distinguished from theology or religious philosophy, in the analogous way, the philosophy of science in Tanabe's sense should be distinguished from scientific philosophy which logical positivists advocated in the 1930s. As Hans Reichenbacher emphasized in the rise of scientific philosophy, logical positivists reduced the task of philosophy to the logic of science and the linguistic analysis of moral language. As theology and metaphysics were deprived of cognitive meaning, scientific philosophy in this sense tends to be Amphila Scientiae, which announces the end of philosophical speculation in the age of technology and science. Also, the influence of logical positivism has declined. The philosophy of science, even when distinguished from scientific philosophy, tends to be a special branch of philosophy whose task is to analyze philosophical problems of a scientific inquiry. It is usually considered as a self-sufficient branch of philosophical study, which is supposed to be quite independent of and indifferent to the problem of the philosophy of religion. Next. On the contrary, Tanabe assumed that the philosophy of science is complementary with the philosophy of religion in such a way that the former mediates science with religion and the latter religion with science. Both science and religion would remain incomplete without our philosophical reflections on their common but unknown foundation. In what way then should we seek this foundation after the Kantian critic philosophy has proven the existence of the inevitable paradoxes and antinomies involved in such trials. If we apply a scientific method to the problems of religion, or a religious criterion to the scientific discussion in the naive and unreflective manner, then the result would be disastrous both to religion and science. It's a grave mistake to assume that science supersedes religion or religious religion anticipates science because they do not provide competing account of the same subject matter. According to Tara, next one, the common but unknown root of science and religion could be unearthed only when we are aware of the basic limitations of our faculties in both science and religion. He interprets the paradoxes and antinomies of pure reason in the Kantian sense, not only as a limitation of a finite human reason, but also as that which shows the very past of historical practice through a radical self-denial of theoretical reason to the real that mediates two incommensurables. In the essay titled Science, Philosophy and Religion, Tanabe writes, The critical spirit of philosophy cannot remain in a neutral standpoint concerning the relation between science and religion. The coexistence of religion and science considered as independent of and indifferent to each other is not a satisfactory situation. Philosophy has to break through the statics of theoretical reason and to undertake its own idea in a humble awareness of its own self-contradictions in the dynamic of historical practices. Next right. Reason must affirm its own destiny to walk the way of action face witness after having been abolished theoretically but resurrected, resurrected practically in the depths of antinomies and paradoxes. The task of philosophy is to mediate, that is, to establish something like analogy and this between science and religion, which do not admit any distinct unifications. Tanabe compares the prime task of the philosophy of science with the solving the koans of science in the same way that them practitioners concentrate themselves 
on solving koan. Koan means the truth manifested as a religious paradox. In a personal view of the philosophy of Shobo Genzo written by Dogen, Tanabe signifies by koan the universal truth that cannot be manifest without paradoxes, which has been suggested by Dogen's usage of Genjo koan, manifesting truth through awakening, thus including coincidentia opposite of science as well as religion. The next slide. And I want to uh, mention the Tanabe's attitudes towards the Japanese war crime after the World War II. This is very important element in his social ethics in the Metanoetics. According to Tanabe, philosophy as Metanoetics is a response to the ethical religious koan which he had to face at the time of Japan's defeat in 1945. Anticipating the coming unconditional defeat of Japan, he asked Nishida to send his message to ex-Prime Minister and a member of the Imperial House, Konoe, who had been a student of Nishida at Kyoto University. In this message, Tanabe tried to persuade the Imperial House to decide to give all its properties to the people for the reconstruction of the nation after the war at its own initiative, rather than from the compulsion of the Allied powers, so that the Imperial House might be the true symbol of the unity of people by its self-negating decisions. Although his message was rejected by Nishida as unrealistic, politically unrealistic, this episode shows how Tanabe, having repented his tacit agreement to imperialistic policies, felt responsible for the disastrous result of the, what is called the Holy War, the war which he could not have prevented during the period of ultra-nationalism. The right motif of Tanabe's philosophy of, as, as metanoetics were to criticize radically the totalitarian ideology of the wartime Japan through metanoia or repentance of its crimes. What makes Tanabe distinct among the Kyoto school is that he had thought through the problem of, problem of history and ethical practice from the standing point of nothingness. He quits, Tanabe criticizes and reformulates Nishida's philosophy of abstract nothingness so that he can reject clearly any monistic or totalitarian interpretation of this philosophy. According to Tanabe, philosophy cannot begin from a self-determination of wholeness because the totality of beings cannot be an object of our intuition. Rather, we can only move from the microscopic and local analysis to the macroscopic and universal synthesis, from the differential equations to the integral solutions, as Tanabe often characterizes his own methodology in terms of mathematical physics. In his philosophy of science, Tanabe compares Nietzsche's conception of absolute nothingness as topos, analogous with, with Lawrence of Newton's ideas of absolute space as something like sensorium day. Tanabe prefers Einstein's relative and local approaches to Lawrence's absolute and universal, because the latter remains to be a mere dogma, whereas the former has a firm foundation in our experiments and observations. Einstein's theory has its own concept of absolute existence, but this absolute is neither mere space nor mere time, but space-time as a four-dimensional manifold which we can describe only through our experimental measurement or what Tanabe calls action realization, although we cannot intuit the totality of space-time. One of the important amendments which Tanabe has made concerning Nietzsche's logic of topos is 
Tarabe has considered the contradictory self-identity as essentially temporarily mediated rather than an absolute principle of immediate intuition. Tarabe criticizes Nietzsche's metaphysical topology of nothingness for its lack of dialectics of dynamic temporal activity. Philosophy based on the unity of opposite without temporal mediation would remain to be a speculative mysticism without any positive principle of historical practice. In the logic of species and schematism of the world, Tanabe writes, Base. Also, Heidegger's fundamental ontology of temporal existence needs synthesis with spatial elements if it is to become a concrete ontology of a social being, though the schematism of the world, this special element, should not be considered as a special expression of the finite topos of nothingness, or the eternal now. Coincidentia oppositorum in the topos of nothingness, conceived as a mere speciality, is nothing more than the static unity of mystical intuition, and cannot be the dynamic unity between time and space. This unity would be possible through the mediation of subject's practice rather than through an immediate intuition of the substratum. Tanabe transforms the unity of contradictories in the logic of topos into in the contrasted opposite in the historical process of becoming, which involve novelty and a discontinuous jump in crisis. For him, history has become the overall koan in which the metaphysical topology of static being is to be superseded by the innovative principle of nothingness in the historical world. Innovative principle of nothingness in the historical world. Nothingness considers as mere speciality which abstracts suffered from a temporal becoming is a mere concept of pure nothingness, which Hegel has identified with a pure being in his dialectics. Therefore, this is not to be confused with absolute nothingness, which Talabe considered essentially as a creative principle of self-transformation. Next slide. Nothingness as a transformative principle of mediation is a key to our understanding of philosophy as metanoetics. Just as pure and Buddhist of Jodo Shinshu abandoning, abandoning their own self-power calls on the name of Amida Buddha as the savior and the mediator of sentient beings for the attainment of freedom or nirvana, in the same way, Tarabe, underscoring the essential finitude of human existence, recommends both metanoia repentance or metanoetis, transcendence of reason, as a necessary means by which we are permitted to attain freedom through dying too and being resurrected from the historical world by the grace of the other power. If we were able to observe history, subspecie, aeter detertis, repentance and hope would be meaningless because it would be a folly to care about what has been determined in the past or will necessarily be in the future, as Spinoza clearly states in his Ethics. But we cannot really observe history as if it were an object of our intuition because our existence itself has a temporal ecstatic structure which is always going beyond and overcoming a previously determined self. It is a throne projection as well as a projected throneness that conforms to and mediates the determination of the past, a transformation of the determined into determining, and therefore it has to be seen as opening up to nothingness. Concerning the relation between the historicity of human reason and metanoesis, Tarabe writes, human reason must be driven through the unpass of contradiction to its own death, and there, mediated by the transformation of absolute nothingness 
it must be restored to a middle way that belongs to neither pole of the contradiction but develops in the new theory as a synthesis of both. This is a circular movement of creativity, a revolution qua restoration that forms the basic structure of history. In metanoesis, the past is not merely a thrownness that has passed away and is out of our control, but the present incessantly renewing its meaning and caught up in an unending circularity in accord with the future that mediates it. We might say that throne project is transformed into a projected strongness. Whereas Heidegger considers death as the ultimate possibility for Dasein, representing the utmost horizon of existential projection of future potentialities, Tanabe complementing throne project with projected strongness provides his dialectical category for the existential communion, existential communion, which the mere existential analysis of Dasein does not recognize between the dead and the living. So, uh, wait a minute. In this way, Tanabe directs its own project and projective strongness in the existential communion correspond to the white hidden concept of subject subject, and therefore to the concept of objective immortality, whereby what is divested of its own living immediacy becomes a real component in other living immediacies of becoming. In either ontology of life or directing of death dedicated to Heidegger on his 70th birthday, Tanabe criticized Heidegger's analysis of being towards death, sein zum Tode, as a non-relational, unbezieglich, solipsistic singularity for its ignoring the essential relatedness, relatedness of the living with the dead. Tanabe underscores the existence of communal sanctorum which the living hold with the dead, whereas Heidegger dealt with death as a singular point of his ontology of life. Tanabe may be said to have resolved, resolved and redeemed this singularity into life in his directive of death. Just as Mahayana Buddhist transforms the Hinayana concept of Nirvana as absolute death in the saving into the saving principle of life in their conception the nirvana that does not remain in absolute nirvana on account of great compassion karma. Tanabe has transformed Heidegger's solipsistic, solipsistic concept of absolute death into an essentially communal one, thus expanding the context in which we can directly discuss both death and resurrected life. Also, the time is up, so I must skip this uh, third part, was chapter three, natural theology based on analogy and this and this, and also the Big Bang cosmology and the concept of nothing in modern physics. Please read this part in the, my personal website. But this is not a, a, uh, the uh, completed papers, so I will uh, rewrite, I want to rewrite this paper, or the tentative paper, but uh, please read the third part. Thank you so much for your patience. Do we have time for a question or two? Or? <laughs> Your question is uh, Amida's, Amida's vow of universal, universal, universal yeah. salvation. If you would just yeah. combine it with the, yeah. the divine family, then you yeah. have everything in the sandwich. Yeah. In the back? 
you noted to Natalie's comparison with Elijah Capazos in the 1930s and uh, and, and, and then uh, by discussion with uh, Heidegger, who was uh, in his sort of existential position. But is there any encounter to Natalie directly with any of the logical positives? Did he sort of keep respond to them, uh, people like Carnac or whatever, in any direct way? Or uh, because from what you're describing, I find to not be somebody, those of us in the Western and European tradition should have been listening to. Yeah, so that about the, uh, we, I mentioned in my papers the logical positive myths in uh, 1930s. So um, I think the, uh, in the Davos conference uh, just after the First World War, uh, Heidegger and Ernst Kassiller and Rudolf Carnap meet in the Davos meetings. The Davos meeting is very similar to the address meetings, that was meeting it says uh, the, uh, something reminds me of the magic mountain that Thomas Mann said. Oh, so the Rudolf Carnap is a logical positivist, and uh, Ernst Castillo is a neo-Kantians, and uh, Martin Heidegger. The, the three persons philosophy is quite different from each other, but after the Davos meeting, the continental philosophy is separates and the continental philosophy, the existentialism and phenomenology are indifferent uh, to the scientific philosophies, etc. It's a very regrettable thing. And I think the Whitehead uh, truly united uh, the Heidegger's analysis of existential analysis, also the Cassidy's philosophy of symbolisms. Mm. So, so Whitehead's philosophy is the uh, integration uh, of Cassidy's theory of symbols or symbolic forms. And Heidegger is very radical, but something like nationalistic biases, these nationalistic biases, those two are trends in the uh, Whitehead systems. So, I think this is not a uh, direct reply to your question, uh, Teams, but I think the, uh, Rudolf Carnap and the Whitehead uh, is a, uh, Whitehead. May, uh, I have heard uh, that Whitehead only mentioned the, the name of Rudolf Carnap uh, in his letters, uh, uh, in one of his letters. Uh, this is uh, Rudolf Carnap is only understands a minor part of especially the uh, mathematical, logical parts, so he does not understand the whole uh, widest philosophies. Mm -hmm. Let me see. All right, well, uh, uh, one last question from Ron. And then we've got a, a shortened break, and then our next sessions should start hopefully around 11.30. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Jumar. I thought the history that you described post-World War II was very fascinating and something I was unaware of, but I want to put a Wojtyla twist upon that and maybe a Moss's twist because the way it was presented was as an act of self-negation to express uh, the un and to achieve unity with the people by giving the wealth to, to the uh, a more communal being. Well, first of all, from a point of view of a lot of progressive philosophy, that accumulation of extreme wealth is not one's wealth, but it's exploited, appropriated wealth on the, on the one hand. So it's not as generous as it may appear on the surface. It's writing an historic wrong of exploitation, which says, Slavery is uh, the end of slavery in America was ending in an act of uh, injustice. But from a whitehead's perspective, acts of generosity are not really self-negating. They're self-actualizing. The beautiful statement in Processing Reality where Whitehead speaks about the intensity of individual interest finding their deepest expression 
when those interests are merged with the aspirations for the common good, the historic uh, lesson you gave us was very beautiful. But I think Whitehead would see it not as a self-negation, but in a more profound, real a sense of self-actualization. Thank you. Yeah. Quick that, response? Yeah, no, no, uh, uh, any question? Uh, I, I appreciate the, that comment from me. I essentially agree. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a great.